Connections, a lesson on relationships. That word connection out of the Webster's Dictionary means this, a person connected with each other, especially by marriage and kinship or common interest. If you look at those last three words, it says marriage, kinship, or common interest. This can be your spouse, your family member, your friends, your boyfriends, your girlfriends, acquaintances, neighbors, uh, people at the workplace. There's so many different connections that we have in life. And there's something that we started out with when we were talking about relationships and, and going vertical. And we talked about this line right here being God and you and me down here and that this is the relationship that has to be important and then we have another relationship that comes this way which is our horizontal relationships which is others we have others over here that we're connected to and then we're here and the, the most important relationship we have is this relationship and I just want to put that visual in front of you as we begin to move forward today that we're, we're, we're trying to fix how all of this works in relationship because these are all related to each other. But we've got to figure out what's important and what's not. <clears throat> so in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, God is the one who kicked all of this off. And he said it this way. He said, now God said it's not good or beneficial for any man to be alone. God was looking at man. The Bible says when God created the heavens and the earth and he created man, he did it in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. He was done creating. He never created another thing. Yet Eve came after the seventh day. So where did Eve come from? Well, the Bible says that, uh, uses the word, especially in the King James, that God closed, that God put Adam to sleep and opened up him and pulled out his rib. But if you really know what that means, it, it was God saying, I'm going to give you a helpmate that's just like you. And how many of you know, ladies, you're not a baby back rib. You're more than that. Come on. And so God didn't just, he didn't just pull a rib. The literal, what he says, he pulled from his side. He took man and ripped man in two like you would a piece of paper. And he, he left the male side and then the female side of man. He just gave that an open relationship where they could see one another in the flesh. And we all know what Adam said when he saw her. What's up, girl? But the Bible actually tells us he said this, you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So he was saying, you're just as much of me as I am me and I'm as much you as you are me. A hundred percent. And God said, it's not beneficial for any man. Now I injected the word any in that parenthesis. That's mine. I put that in the scripture because it's not just man the male who God cared about. He cared about humanity. How many of you know it's not good for any human to be alone? Male or female. And this is what God was fixing by separating male and female. You know, one of our mottos around here is with our small groups, and that's that we don't want you to do life alone. Because we believe life change happens through connections in relationships. So we've looked at that that definition of the word connection, which means kinship, marriage, and through interaction with people. But the, the word relationship is a little different than connections. How two or more people or groups talk to, behave towards, and interact with each other. So what we see is there's the connection where we see each other. We're born into a family. We're connected in some way. But just because you're connected doesn't mean that you have a relationship. Connections happen, then relationship. Boy goes to Silver Diner, sits at counter, orders breakfast. Four girls come in, sit at booth, order breakfast. Boy looks over to booth, and one girl looks up from her, her eggs and goes... How many of you know that's a connection? But how many of you know there's no relationship? How many of you, come on, how many of you, that's how it started with you and your wife? You just looked over and said, oh my, oh my Lord. That's how it started with Steph and I. She looked at me and said, oh my boy. <laughs> no, we, some reason we connected. But before we ever had a relationship, we had to connect. 
But once we connected, we realized that this was going to go further. And God wants your connections to be the right one. How many of you want to have the right connections in 2020? And how many of you know what it's like not to have the right connections? Right? So we're fixing that through knowledge. So how we behave and talk to and interact with each other. I read this. The six most important words in a relationship are, I admit I made a mistake. The five most important words in a relationship are, you did a good job. The four most important words in a relationship is, what do you think? The three most important words in a relationship is, after you, please. The two most important words are, thank you. And the one most important word is, we. And the least important word is, I. Me or I, that's right. Because in relationship, it's about pushing the other person up, not about me. Yet we are born with a me attitude. Any parents in here have toddlers or little kids and you've invited people over for a play date? They bring their kids. Your child hasn't played with a particular toy in a month. But the other child picks up the toy that your child hasn't played with in a month. And what does your child do? Mine, 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 mine. mine. And you are totally embarrassed. And you're doing everything you can to not pull that stick out you beat your child with in front of that other parent. <laughs> you're like trying to be the good parent and you're looking at them, your eyes are saying, don't make me get the stick. You're embarrassed, why? Because that child has in it from birth selfishness. But how many of you know we as adults sometimes don't grow out of that and a lot of times we just carry it over, we just act like adults that are selfish, right? The worst word is I, and the greatest word is we. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, which has been our go vertical scripture. I want you to read the yellow when you see it on the screen. Look if about living your life in Christ to what's going on in Christ and see things. When it comes to relationships, there's only one way relationships can work. We have got to see it from his perspective. We cannot take it from our own selfish perspective because we're like the little child who hasn't played with the toy in a month. The minute somebody touches it, we want to say, wait a minute, what about me? What about me? So over the last two weeks, we've covered, this, these are the points that we've covered, a lot of points. Look, connections are personal, they're powerful, they're partnership. Connections can be complicated. They can involve communication. Connections need compromise. Connections require commitment, and they demand consistency. Now, these are all the things. We've covered this in two weeks. Do you realize that with all of those points, I could only scratch the surface of each one of those points, especially in the 40 minutes and two weeks that I've had, right? 80 minutes we've gone over those, those points. I'm not here. I'm not some relationship expert, but I know the one who is. And so we're giving you principles from the Word of God to help you to go home and to study these on your own. I'm here to spark you to study so that in 2020 you can go vertical in your relationships. This is simply a lesson on connections and how to make them better. So my first point that we're adding to the ones we've already had is the right connections need priority. The right connections need priority. That word priority means the condition of being more important than something or someone else and therefore coming or being dealt with first. Priorities, what do you do first? And the right connections in your life have to have priority. My wife has got to have priority in my life. She's got to be number one on this earth. But I got news for her and I got news for you. She's not number one in my life. She is not number one in my life. Because for my relationship for her to be right, I've got to make God number one in my life. This vertical relationship that we're talking about right here, this relationship is always first. And when you put this relationship first, this relationship always works. If this relationship is not working, it is because we have not gone vertical and seen what God wants us to see in the relationship. 
God first. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 32. As I read the scripture, I want you to hear Jesus' voice. Okay? He said this. First and most importantly, seek, aim at, strive after God's kingdom and his righteousness. His way of doing and being right. The attitude and the character of God. I want to stop there for a second. Jesus said first and most importantly, God first. God first. So in all my relationship with my wife, the only way that relationship's going to work is if I put God first. With my children, the only way that my relationship with my children is really going to work is if I put God first. My relationship with you, the only way my relationship is going to work in this church is if I have God first. And when I put that in priority, I want you to show you what the scripture says. It says a lot about following after and doing right and being right and the attitude and care. And then it says all of these things will be given to you. That means everything outside of this relationship, everything that's outside of this relationship. Look what it says. And these things will be, what's that word? Given. Didn't say you'd earn it. Didn't say you'd have to work for it. It said that Everything else, when you put God as a priority, everything else will be given to you. He's going to give you a good job. He's going to give you a good place to live. He's going to give you peace. He's going to give you joy. He's going to give you your girl. He's going to give you your boy. He's going to do all of that because you put him first. And so in my priority of relationship, I want you to hear me. God is always first. Then my relationship with my spouse comes second. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 28. Husbands should love their wives as they love their own bodies. Let me tell you something about loving my body. <laughs> you guys act like teenagers. <laughs> he said loving his own body. Let me Does the Bible say I'm supposed to love my own body? I want this girl to love my body too. What's up? The Bible says, as I love my own self, my own body, that's how I'm supposed to love her. Listen, men, for us to really work our relationship, we're supposed to love our wives like we love ourselves. Look what else it says. It says, the man who loves his wife loves himself. The scripture says that's why a man will leave his father and mother and join his wife, and the two will become what? I just told you in Genesis that God ripped them in half, didn't he? Look what happens in marriage. He takes that which was ripped in half and made single, and what happens in marriage? He brings them back and they become one. What a mystery. But that was the plan in the beginning, was to bring us back together. Now, that doesn't mean single being single. doesn't mean that you're uh, um, a broken piece. You are a whole piece. The word single means nothing missing, nothing broken. You are single. But ultimately, I believe all of us want connection. And I think ultimately, we all do want that intimate relationship. Some of us have gone through some intimate relationships that didn't end so well. Some of us even went as far as to get married and they didn't end so well. Can I say to you, no judgment on you. We want peace in your life. We want you to know we love you, we care about you, and there is no judgment from this platform to what's going on in your life. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, who you did it with, or how many times you've done it. God loves you, and He has a plan for your life. I believe that with all of my heart. There have been times where the church has been way too judgmental. The Bible says, judge not, lest you be judged. So we're not here to judge you. So as we talk about relationships... Don't separate yourself out because your circumstance right now doesn't fit the perfect category. Okay? Help me today. I don't want to isolate anybody in this room through reading these scriptures, okay? So when we look at everything, and when it comes to priorities, I read this quote. It says, priorities will tell you everything you need to know about a person. Somebody else's priorities will tell you everything you need to know. What they put first will tell you everything you need to know about them. Now look what it says. After you become one because the man's done his job, a wife is to respect, love, and encourage her husband. 
Now, let me say this to you. In our home, there is an understanding that I have the role first. My role first is to love her like I love myself. My role first is to lift her up and to take care of her. And if I'm not doing that, she is not going to be able to respect, love, and encourage me. Because she, quit clapping back there, girl. What you doing over there? That's <laughs> what I'm talking about. My wife is like the moon and I am like the sun. And when I do my part, her love for me is a reflection of my love for her. And when that is not being reflected back on me, it is not her fault. It is... <laughs> there are some women wearing out the amen. <laughs> when I do my part, look what happens. And the wife respects, loves, and encourages her husband because she becomes a reflection of him loving her like he loves himself. Come on, somebody say amen to that. And that is the way relationships work in an intimate setting. What about friendships? What about when you're not married, you're single, and you're dealing with each other? Proverbs 17, 7 says, A dear friend will love you no matter what. And a family sticks together through all kinds of trouble. So we've covered the intimate marriage relationship. Now we're talking about friends and marriage. I mean, friends and family. And it says, a dear friend will love you no matter what. How many of you want a friend like that? Can I say to you, it's not talking about your friend. It's talking about you. You have to love no matter what. You need to be the dear friend. Because when you become the dear friend, God will give you a dear friend. Amen? We have to, and let me say this, that is not going to be a whole lot of people. When you have your circle of people in your life, in here, there's not much room. There's not much room in this center circle for people. And so you have to really prioritize, come on somebody, who's going to be in that circle? They have to be a priority because God is first, but whoever's coming into this circle right here is going to be very few. And you have to know that you can trust them. And the way that you give yourself, they need to give back. And can I say to you, if you have a friend, you're not married, maybe you're just dating, you're engaged, whatever. If you're engaged and you're not married, you ain't married. Wasn't that a great revelation? And I'm going to say this to you. If that person doesn't treat you right, get out of that relationship immediately. Because if they're not going to treat you right when you're dating, what do you think they're going to treat you once they put that ball and chain on you? And I don't mean that in a negative sense. I'm saying once you're connected, if they treat you bad before you say I do, what do you think they're going to treat you after you? Come on, somebody, help me out in here. So this circle is going to be very small, okay? Then we have an outer circle where we allow certain people, and then we go further out. And how we treat people and how they treat us, a dear friend will love you no matter what. You need to marry your best friend. Look at the person next to you and say, he's talking to you. They asked a small boy to define the word friend, and he said, somebody who knows all about you and likes you the same. Now, I want you to think all about you, and you tell somebody all about you. Why are we giggling? Because we know we will run some folk off. <laughs> so let me tell you about me. They're like, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know what? My, my Apple Watch is going off. I got to go. Because you start saying things that makes them nervous. How many of you want to be able to share who you are with the person that you can trust the most and they look at you the same no matter what you share? Amen. And that's that small circle that we allow people in that we trust because no matter what. I've learned the hard way when it comes to prioritizing. As a young pastor, I would get confused about people and where they were supposed to land on my priority list because I was doing everything I could to serve the people and take care of them but my wife and kids were suffering because everybody's pulling on you they're pulling on you you know and you feel like hey I'm a young pastor I'm supposed to love the people love the people but I'll tell you what people will wear you out 
You know, they come, they come with their problems. You, you didn't, you're just there to love them, but, but they'll drag you down. You have to prioritize. My wife has to be first above this church. She's number one above this church. I haven't always been good at that, but I'm getting better. Because, you know what? When y'all are gone, I'm praying she stays. <laughs> My kids, same thing. We work together as a family. That's tough. It's tough. I mean, you think about it. My kids have to work for their dad. That, you know what I'm saying? They, they want to probably go out and do something, spread their wings and go out and change the world. And they end up working for me. It's their cross they bear in Jesus' name. No, it's up to me to make sure that we as a family... And then my staff, that we are all treated appropriately. And I have that huge responsibility to do the right thing so that there'll be a reflection back to me of respect and honor. Can you see? It's the same as the marriage relationship. How we treat someone, we'll get back. How many of you know that? It's so important, okay? So um, the second point is this. The right connections will have purity. The right connections will have purity. So the right connections have to be prioritized, and then the right connections will have purity. You cannot mix oil and water together. You can pour as, pour as much oil and water together as you want and mix it up with all you want to, and the oil and the water will separate every single time. And it's the same thing with relationships. You can't have an impure and a pure relationship with somebody. They'll never be able to go together. You might say, oh, pastor, come on. They're not that bad. Can I say to you, not everything that's attractive is positive. Not everything that's attractive is positive. As a matter of fact, you don't always have to swipe right. Oh yeah, I just said that to you. Sometimes you got to swipe left and just keep on swiping until God says to swipe right. Then you know because not everything that's attractive is positive. Titus chapter 1 verse 15 says this, To those who are pure, all things are pure. But to those who are tainted and unbelieving, nothing is pure because their minds are polluted. You ever been around somebody like that? You, you ended up maybe in a business with them, maybe you were, they were part of your team on the job, or maybe they were out with other friends and they were in the... And man, everything that they said come out of their mouth was polluting the, the atmosphere. And when you get away from those people, you feel like you just got to take a shower. You got to go take a bath, you know. You just want to gar go gargle. Because what they're doing is their mind is so polluted and, and their actions and their unbelieving ways are polluting you. Can I say to you, they should never be in these circles. To the pure, all things are pure. That means to the pure, we hang around the pure. That doesn't mean we don't go out into the world and, well, listen, we're doing, right now we're working on inside the four walls of the church, but the minute we leave here, we immediately go outside the four walls of this church and start loving people that don't know anything about what we're talking about so that they can find the same thing that we have found inside the four walls. You've got to have purity. What does the word pure mean? It means free from what weakens, pollutes, or makes defective. God wants you free from relationships that weaken you. He wants you free from relationships that pollute you. And he wants you free from relationships that make your life defective. He wants your life to be pure. Hebrews chapter 13, 4 says, Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed should be kept pure. You know, let me tell you something about the marriage bed. I got one girl up in my bed. It's that one right there. Ain't going to be no other girls up in my bed but this girl right here. And there are not going to be any other men in the bed except for me with her. We're going to keep our bed pure. The only other person allowed in there is my dog, Leo. And he's fluffy and cute. And we both agree on that. I realize society tells you something different. But we're not in here talking about society. We're in here talking about the kingdom. We're in here talking about living above the way that the people around us live. Not because we're better but because we want that relationship with Christ unpolluted. Psalm chapter 119.9 says this, How can a young man keep his way pure? Now I just said about a marriage bed, I'm coming over to the singles. How can a young man? Now when it says man, how many of you know it's not talking about gender? Come on, I've taught you this. It's talking about what? Humanity. 
How can humanity, both men and women, keep their way pure? This is how you keep your way pure, by guarding it according to the Word of God. When you're going along, if this is your way in life, you should be guarding your steps with what the Word of God says. As a matter of fact, let me show you how the Amish do it. Can I have my picture of the Amish? Look at this young man on this horse with his little buggy up there in Lancaster. You ever been to Lancaster and seen the Amish up there? riding around in their buggies, but this is a single young man, not married, and required within their community is that a single young man ride in this kind of buggy. And then when you get married, next picture, you get this kind of buggy. You all know what I'm talking about too, don't you? This is how they multiply the community, is in this buggy. Can you see that the Amish are trying to instill in their younger generation, come on, we may not all agree with that. I get it. I understand that. Whatever. But I think the principle's right. The principle's right. How will a young man and young woman keep their way pure? How will that happen? By focusing on what the Word of God says and putting God in the center and doing things right. Look at the person next to you and say, you need an open buggy. Tell them. <laughs> Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German pastor during the reign of the Nazis in Germany, said this. I want you to really hear this is one of the best quotes I've heard about purity. The pursuit of purity is not about the suppression of lust, about, but about the reorientation of one's life to a greater goal. You see, we struggle with lust. The Bible calls it the lust of the flesh. Now, when we hear the word lust, we, we always think a negative thing, you know, a man looking at a woman with some kind of thought or a woman looking at a man with some kind of thought, you know, undressing them while they're looking at him or whatever. Or, Boy, she looked good. Thinking about things. That's what we begin to think about. The pursuit of purity is not about the suppression. In other words, going around in life and saying, ah, I'm dealing with this. I've got to push it down. You know, I don't want to look. I don't want to do that. Or I have such a struggle with this. And I'm just struggling. It's not about the suppression of lust. It's about rising above it to something bigger. Living your life up here, not down here. And when, when we learn that it's not a fight to suppress, but it's a goal to live a life with God, then we start rising up in our relationships and now purity begins to work in our life. We need to prioritize our relationships. Purity is important. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 says this, don't make partners with those who reject God. How can you make a partnership out of right and wrong? That's not a partnership, that's war. Don't link up with those who will pollute you. Look what God said. I want you all to myself. He wants you pure in, in, your, in your motives so that he can hold you tight to himself. Number three, the last point is this. The right connections will enrich us. That word enrich means to improve one's position in life. So the right connection in my life is going to improve my position, but it's going to improve your position because it's the right connection. Come on, somebody. How many of you want to enrich your connections in 2020? We do this through putting principles to work rather than just letting the lust of our flesh have whatever it wants. We, we, we put it aside and we live for a greater cause and a greater expression of relationship. Ecclesiastes 4.9 Two can accomplish more than twice as much as one. If one falls, the other pulls him up. But if one man falls when he's alone, he's in trouble. On a cold night, two under the same blanket gain warmth from the other. But how can one be warm alone? And one standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three is even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. I find it interesting that it starts out with one 
and then two, and then the scripture fills that center up with about three. Your relationships that are real close to you are going to be able to be counted on less than one hand because those are the people you can open up to and trust. And you can be pure with them and they can be pure with you. Real connections are never about ourselves, they're about each other. It's when people continually go out of their way and, and push each other up that we feel connected. Not about me, but about we. Not about I, but about you. Two more things and I'm going to close. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. Let's discover the creative ways to encourage each other and to motivate each other towards acts of compassion, doing beautiful works as expressions of love. I, I want to find creative ways, like showing you pictures of the Amish, to get you to see what this is saying, to encourage each other and to motivate each other toward acts of compassion and doing beautiful works. This is what God, in our connections, in our relationships, our motive should be, how can I come up with something creative that's going to make you better? What can I do to inspire you to do something beautiful? And what can you do to inspire me so that I want to keep doing what I'm doing? Come on, somebody. How many of you know everybody needs somebody to cheer them along in a race? Don't you love those pictures of somebody running a race and somebody's holding a bottle of water out for them? Isn't that, the, the, that is one of the most powerful pictures. When somebody's running and somebody has taken the time to get ahead of them and hold out a bottle of water and they just run by and grab that bottle of water. How many of you know two are better than one? And what is a person with the bottle of water saying? Ultimately, they're saying, I'm glad I'm not the one running. <laughs> but I got some water for you, bruh. <laughs> no, they're saying, what are they saying? I got your back. I got your back. I'm here for you. And what do you think it does for the person who's sweating and hurting? Somebody's got my back. I want to be the person holding the bottle out, don't you? I just want to be that person if someone's running in life and all hell's breaking loose, that I get ahead of them. And there I'm standing with a bottle of encouragement. There I am to push them up. There I am with absolute purity in my motive. I'm not struggling because I got a higher life to think about. Would you stand up with me? I read about a British publication that offered a prize for the best definition of a friend. Thousands of answers were received and the following was the winning definition for friend. A friend is the one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. When there's nobody left, your friend will be there. <laughs>